Hello guys, and welcome to my channel. Due to YouTube copyright infringement, we only use one picture with voiceover. Thank you for understanding. If you love history and biographies, please leave a like and a sub. Let's start the video. William Herschel, born November 15, 1738. Hanover, Hanover, died August 25, 1822. Slough, Buckinghamshire, England, German-born British astronomer. The founder of sidereal astronomy for the systematic observation of the stars and nebulae beyond the solar system. He discovered the planet Uranus, hypothesized that nebulae are composed of stars, and developed a theory of stellar evolution. He was knighted in 1816. Herschel's father was an army musician. Following the same profession, the boy played in the band of the Hanoverian Guards. After the French occupation of Hanover in 1757, he escaped to England, where at first he earned a living by copying music. But he steadily improved his position by becoming a music teacher, performer, and composer, until in 1766 he was appointed organist of a fashionable chapel in Bath, the well-known spa. By this time, the intellectual curiosity he had acquired from his father led him from the practice to the theory of music, which he studied in Robert Smith's harmonics. From this book he turned to Smith's A Complete System of Optics, which introduced him to the techniques of telescope construction and whetted his appetite for viewing the night sky. Combining obstinacy with boundless energy, William was not content to observe the nearby sun, moon, and planets, as did nearly all astronomers of his day, but was determined to study the distant celestial bodies as well, and he realized he would need telescopes with large mirrors to collect enough light, larger, in fact, than opticians could supply at reasonable cost. He was soon forced to grind his own mirrors. They were ground from metal discs of copper, tin, and antimony in various proportions. In 1781 his ambitions outran the capacities of the local foundries, and so he prepared to cast molten metal into discs in the basement of his own home. But the first mirror cracked on cooling, and on the second attempt the metal ran out onto the flagstones, after which even he accepted temporary defeat. His later and more successful attempts produced ever larger mirrors of superb quality, and his telescopes proved far superior even to those used at the Greenwich Observatory. He also made his own eyepieces, the strongest with a magnifying power of 5,787 times. When used with a telescope with a 7-foot, 2.1-meter, focal length, dot at Bath, he was helped in his researches by his brother Alexander, who had come from Hanover, and his sister, Caroline, who was his faithful assistant through much of his career. News of this extraordinary household began to spread in scientific circles. He made two preliminary telescopic surveys of the heavens. Then, in 1781, during his third and most complete survey of the night sky, William came upon an object that he realized was not an ordinary star. It proved to be the planet Uranus, the first planet to be discovered since prehistoric times. William became famous almost overnight. His friend Dr. William Watson, Jr., introduced him to the Royal Society of London, which awarded him the Copley Medal for the discovery of Uranus and elected him a fellow. Watson also helped him to secure in 1782 an annual pension of £200 from George III. He could thus give up music and devote himself exclusively to astronomy. At this time William was appointed as an astronomer to George III and the Herschels moved to that chet, near Windsor Castle. Although he was 43 years old when he became a professional astronomer, William worked night after night to develop a natural history of the heavens. A fundamental problem for which Herschel's big telescopes were ideally suited concerned the nature of nebulae, which appear as luminous patches in the sky. Some astronomers thought they were nothing more than clusters of innumerable stars, the light of which blends to form a milky appearance. Others held that some nebulae were composed of a luminous fluid. When William's interest in nebulae developed in the winter of 1781-82, to 82, 
he quickly found that his most powerful telescope could resolve into stars several nebulae that appeared milky to less well-equipped observers. He was convinced that other nebulae would eventually be resolved into individual stars with more powerful instruments. This encouraged him to argue in 1784 and 1785 that all nebulae were formed of stars, and that there was no need to postulate the existence of a mysterious luminous fluid to explain the observed facts. Nebulae that could not yet be resolved must be very distant systems, he maintained, and, since they seem large to the observer, their true size must indeed be vast, possibly larger even than the star system of which the Sun is a member. By this reasoning, William was led to postulate the existence of what later were called island universes of stars. In order to interpret the differences between these star clusters, it was natural for William to emphasize their relative densities, which he did by contrasting a cluster of tightly packed stars with others in which the stars were widely scattered. These formations showed that attractive forces were at work with the passage of time, he maintained. Widely scattered stars would no doubt condense into one or more tightly packed clusters. In other words, a group of widely scattered stars was at an earlier stage of its development than one whose stars were tightly packed. Thus, William made change in time, or evolution, a fundamental explanatory concept in astronomy. In 1785 he developed a cosmogony, a theory concerning the origin of the universe. The stars originally were scattered throughout infinite space in which attractive forces gradually organized them into even more fragmented and tightly packed clusters. Turning then to the system of stars of which the Sun is part, he sought to determine its shape on the basis of two assumptions, one, that with his telescope he could see all the stars in our system, and two, that within the system the stars are regularly spread out. Both of these assumptions he subsequently had to abandon. But in his studies he gave the first major example of the usefulness of stellar statistics in that he could count the stars and interpret this data in terms of the extent in space of the galaxy's star system. Other astronomers, cut off from the evidence by the modest size of their telescopes and unwilling to follow William in his boulderizing, could only look on with varying degrees of sympathy or skepticism. In 1787 the Herschels moved to Old Windsor and the following year to nearby Slough, where William spent the rest of his life. Night after night, whenever the moon and weather permitted, he observed the sky in the company of Caroline, who recorded his observations. On overcast nights, William would post a watchman to summon him if the clouds should break. Often in the daytime, Caroline would summarize the results of their work while he directed the construction of telescopes many of which he sold to supplement their income. His largest instrument, too cumbersome for regular use, had a mirror made of speculum metal, with a diameter of 122 centimeters, 48 inches, and a focal length of 12 meters, 40 feet. Completed in 1789, it became one of the technical wonders of the 18th century. William's achievement, in a field in which he became a professional only in middle life, was made possible by his own total dedication and the selfless support of Caroline. He seems not to have considered the possibility of marriage until after the death in 1786 of a friend and neighbor, John Pitt, whose widow, Mary, was a charming and pleasant woman. Before long, William proposed marriage, he and Mary would live in the Pitt house, while Caroline would remain at observatory house in Slough. But Mrs. Pitt was shrewd enough to realize that William's commitment would be to Observatory House, which they made their principal home after their marriage on May 8, 1788. William continued his labor in astronomy, but as the rigors of observing took their toll of William's health, he came to appreciate more and more the comforts that Mary's sensible management brought to his home. William's grand concept of stellar organization received a jolt on November 13, 1790, when he observed a remarkable nebula, which he was forced to interpret as a central star surrounded by a cloud of luminous fluid. This discovery contradicted his earlier views. Hitherto William had reasoned that many nebulae that he was unable to resolve, separate into distinct stars. Even with his best telescopes, 
might be distant Phyland universes, such objects are now known as galaxies. He was able, however, to adapt his earlier theory to this new evidence by concluding that the central star he had observed was condensing out of the surrounding cloud under the forces of gravity. In 1811 he extended his cosmogony backward in time to the stage when stars had not yet begun to form out of the fluid. This example of Williams the Rising is typical of his thinking, an unrivaled wealth of observations interpreted by means of bold though vulnerable assumptions. For example, in dealing with the structural organization of the heavens, he assumed that all stars were equally bright, so that differences in apparent brightness are an index only of differences in distances. Throughout his career he stubbornly refused to acknowledge the accumulating evidence that contradicted this assumption. Herschel's labors through 20 years of systematic sweeps for nebulae, 1783 to 1802, resulted in three catalogues listing 2,500 nebulae and star clusters that he substituted for the 100 or so milky patches previously known. He also catalogued 848 double stars, pairs of stars that appear close together in space, and measurements of the comparative brightness of stars. He observed that double stars did not occur by chance as a result of random scattering of stars in space, but that they actually revolved about each other.